is the Battle of Islandwana, and it is a part of, and actually the first battle of the Anglo-Zulu War. Uh, this battle itself is going to happen in January of 1879. And uh, one of the things you need to know about it is the British Empire is going to lead an expeditionary force, a three-pronged expeditionary force of about 4,000 uh, British and uh, native and colonials into uh, basically uh, Zulu territory, heading towards Zululand. And what's going to happen is they're led by a gentleman named uh, Lieutenant General Lord Chelmsford. And Chelmsford believes that a show of force with disciplined British regulars supported by colonials and natives uh, with artillery, of which they had six field pieces, uh, is going to stop any native desire to attack or uh, invade any British territory. Basically, this is a show of force. And Lord Chelmsford is supremely confident. Uh, most of the British soldiers that are uh, under his command are experienced uh, colonial fighters. They've, they've been doing this in the colonies. They know what they're doing. They know how to fight in Africa. As a matter of fact, Lord Chelmsford actually had rules regarding fighting in Africa. Uh, no matter what, whenever you camp, you always logger up, which means you take your uh, wagons and you circle the wagons or you dig trenches in order to protect yourself then you set out pickets or guards and you also send out your cavalry as your eyes and ears and that way you're not going to be surprised and you're not going to uh, be overrun and that was standing orders so here's the deal Lord Chelmsford is looking for the Zulu and he sends his force out. He picks an interesting time. It's, the, it's toward the end of the rainy season. What Chelmsford believes is this is a time when all of the Zulu are going to be uh, away dealing with their farms and dealing with uh, their cattle. And so they're not going to all be together. Uh, he was wrong. As a matter of fact, it was the exact opposite time that he should have attacked because all of the Zulu were actually all together at this time. It was the, a, a festival that uh, signified the, uh, the, uh, the end of the growing season. And so they were all basically obligated as militia units to all come together. And they had already done this. And so the Zulu were massed together. The other problem with traveling when uh, Chelmsford did is it's going to be more muddy. Chelmsford is going to end up only being able to travel about a mile a day. That's miserable. Uh, in contrast, the Zulu traveled on average easily 10 miles a day. And so you've got an idea that the Zulu can move a lot faster. So Chelmsford is going to head towards where he believes that the Zulu are. And uh, what he's going to do is he is going to decide, because the number one fear that he has is the Zulu are going to run away and he's not going to be able to get them. So he figures one, eventually when he gets close enough, he's going to split his forces and try to envelop the Zulu and then overwhelm them with firepower. And what happens is they make it to Islandwanda and they set their camp up. The problem is the ground here is super hard. It's rocky. And so Chelmsford says, you know what, with the amount of firepower we have, there's no conceivable way anyone is going to bother to attack us. And so we are not going to logger up. We are not going to circle the wagons. Uh, they had about 2,000 cattle alone with them and 130 wagons. The wagons alone would have made quite a fortress. Uh, so what they did is they set up their camp. They chose an interesting area. There's a hill here, a ridge here, a pretty big ridge right here, and another ridge over here. The uh, problem is that Chelmsford took about half of his force away looking for the Zulu. Now what Chelmsford didn't realize was that he was chasing a diversion. What the Zulu did is they sent a small group over here to be seen. And Chelmsford took the bait. 
he divided his command, which is something you don't want to do when you're in the face of the enemy unless it's planned and you know exactly where the enemy is. Well, he didn't know 100% where the enemy was, but he thought their main army was here. So Chelmsford took the bulk of his forces, and he is going to leave. The guys that were left, they were uh, led by a gentleman named uh, Henry Pauline, and he was a brevet lieutenant colonel. And he is going to have with him less than 2,000 men. Right? Of that, he has cavalry that is eventually going to show up a little later under a gentleman named uh, Colonel Anthony Durnford. Uh, he has about 700 British regulars, uh, about 1,000 colonials or natives and others, uh, camp followers. Uh, they have two field cannon left behind and a couple of rockets. Uh, what they don't realize is they are going to come up against uh, really about 20,000 Zulu impis. We already described the impis. They use a uh, shield made of cowhide that protects their, almost their entire body. They primarily use the asagai, which is about this long. Most of it is a spear tip. The rest is wood, and it's used to spear the enemy. Right? And Shaka taught them how to do that. Well, 20,000 impis are not over here. This is just a diversionary force. 20,000 impies are actually over here, and they are about seven miles away, or roughly 11 kilometers away. Not that far. This is a big deal. There's a lot of them. All right. What's going to happen is this. All right. The British are met with Colonel Durnford. Durnford arrives with a cavalry unit, and just so you know, he should now be in command because he outranks Pauline. But Durnford does not take command. The reason he does this is he's like, listen, you've already got your camp set up, you've already got your soldiers ready, I'm not going to mess with things, I'll just command my troops. And what they decide to do is Durnford says, we've got to go out, we've got to look for the enemy. So that's Durnford. He's going to go out and take a look for the enemy. Right. Pauline sends some of his guys off on this ridge to eyeball over here. This is where they anticipate that the enemy is. This is where the original reports came from. And Chelmsford is off over here. All right. Durnford heads this way to look for the enemy. All right. Now, one of the things that you should know is that the British were armed with an amazing rifle called the Martini Henry. And the reason it's an amazing rifle, it's pretty darn heavy. It's a little over nine pounds when it's loaded, but it's a big weapon. It fires a bullet with a lot of powder behind it, and it's roughly about a 45 caliber or so. So it's a pretty big bullet, and the way you fire it is there's a lever, and it's a breech loader. You put the bullet in, pop the lever back, and it fires. And a good soldier can fire somewhere between 10 and 12 rounds per minute. It's effective up to about 400 yards, meaning someone who is well-trained can hit a man-sized target 400 yards away. That's, that's pretty good. Right. Uh, the uh, men under Durnford are carrying 70 rounds, so 70 bullets. That means under sustained fire, those of you who know math have recognized that you can maintain sustained fire for about six minutes. That's about it with 70 rounds. Right? So you can fire as fast as you can for six minutes, then you're out of bullets. That's an issue, and it's going to be an issue, by the way. So what happens is this. These guys travel over here. What they didn't realize was that the entire army of the Zulu is here. And they're situated in their traditional fighting style. And their fighting style is cool. It's like a bull. You have the horns of the bull right there, usually made up of young soldiers. You have this area right here, right, which is known as the chest of the bull. And then you have this, which is the loins. Right? This is the biggest group. The loins are usually made up of the older soldiers. And what the goal of this group is, these guys are young and fast. What's going to happen if they charge? What happens if these guys charge forward? What's going to happen with these guys? All right, well, think about this. Even if there was no enemy near them, 
and all these guys started to sprint forward. What's going to happen to the wings here? They go around. They will get se they will get separated, but it's because they're faster. So they're going to move forward faster. These guys will hit the enemy, but then what can these guys do? Surround, Surround them. Surround them. That's the horns of the bull. Yep. That was their fighting tactic. And almost all of these guys are armed with either asagais. Some of them used clubs. They have a few old rifles, but they're not terribly effective. They haven't been trained in really using them. Plus, the, uh, uh, the Zulu thought that uh, true warriors used an asagai because it gave the other guy an opportunity to get you. Right, so it's pretty, uh, it's much more brave to stab someone than it is to shoot someone. All right, so here's what's going to happen. Durnford's men crest this ridge and they look down and they see 20,000 Zulu. Now what's going to happen is they're going to leave 5,000 of them in reserve. Those are going to go to a different place called Works Drift a little bit later. But 20,000 men, Durnford looks at them and he's like, um, retreat? because they had to. The Zulu see them, and so they begin their attack. They didn't want to begin their attack that day. They actually wanted to attack at dawn the next day. But it doesn't matter. They charge. Durnford, running away with his men, starts what is called a, uh, a fighting retreat. So what's going to happen is these guys are here, but as they are moving back, they're going to stop, they're going to shoot, they're going to move, they're going to shoot. The idea is to slow these guys down. They also send a runner back here to say, we've found the enemy, they're not over here, they're right in front of us and they'll be here very soon because they're running. Right? What's going to happen is the Zulu are going to move forward, they're going to overrun a rocket battery. The rocket battery actually, if this uh, were uh, to scale, would have been down here. So the rocket battery fired off a couple rockets but really didn't do anything useful. Durnford's men eventually find themselves in a ravine and they hunker down and they start shooting. What's going to happen is this group is going to hit this ridge and when they hit this ridge it is a massive, massive group. Unbelievably huge. This group is going to swing this way. This group is going to attempt to come through here. All right? And you still have the loins pushing in here. So this is potentially very bad for these guys. What they do is they are going to form up. They pull these scouts in here and they form up into thin lines, thin red lines, if you will. And the goal is to mass their firepower onto these individuals coming this way. Right now, they only see the guys in the middle. And so they put up their artillery, and they start shooting here. These guys all start shooting this way. And the gunfire is effective. It's going to slow down the Zulu. The Zulu that came through the center are going to be slowed. These guys, Durnford's men, see these guys and so they engage. Right? So you got a battle going on here. Nothing's happening necessarily here. Huge battle here. Right? Very quickly, runners are sent to Lord Chelmsford. You gotta come back. Lord Chelmsford refuses to believe that this is the real attack, so he does not send reinforcements. Basically, he figured, oh, the men that I left there can hold their own. It's natives. What could they possibly do? Anyways, the main force is in front of me. All right, that is not true. What eventually happens is these guys are, it's almost like a stalemate, because they're hitting, they're being hit with massive gunfire, artillery, these guys are running out of ammunition, so they have to run back and get ammunition. Some accounts say it was difficult to get it out of the boxes, but they were running back, getting ammunition, and keeping their fire. As long as they could keep their fire on the Zulu, the Zulu either had to hunker down, some of them hit the ground, or they couldn't advance, 
And so if a Zulu can't get there, these guys can't get hurt because a Zulu has to be in stabbing range. So they're keeping up a fire. Here's where a problem happens. And you can see a couple potential problems getting ready to occur. This horn is now here. This is still here. Durnford's men run out of ammunition. So they have to drop back and get more. So they go back here to pick up ammo. What this is going to do is what? Allow them to go It on. leaves it open. It's going to leave the British right flank open. And that's what happens. These guys are able to charge in here. At the same time, the Zulu are ordered to charge. Don't hide, charge. You've got to get close. You've got to engage. They move forward. And at the same time, these guys come in. Right? Pauline makes the only decision that he can, and he forces his men to drop back. That concentrates their fire as best as they can. Right? But they really don't have anything to hide behind. They didn't set up their, uh, their wagons in a logger or anything like that. And what is happening is they're being attacked on all sides. Eventually, what occurs is the weight of numbers is going to tell on the British. And what's going to occur is some of them attempted to escape. It started with some of the natives. They actually escaped first. And there's, there's obviously a good reason for this. They weren't well armed. The British didn't give them the best guns. And they're like, you know what? I've had enough. I'm going to try to get out of here. The British stayed at their posts. And people with horses started to get ideas, as you can imagine. What happens next is a massacre. Because these guys, if they haven't left yet, they're not going to leave. You're going to have some amazing last stands. Durnford and most of his men are going to die to a man defending this area. All right? Pauline is going to be killed. Uh, Lord Chelmsford's uh, tent was specifically attacked, and there was one guy who guarded it. Uh, he happened to be an Irishman. And uh, he was eventually killed. They took the flag. They attempted to take some of the other flags. And you guys know that battle flags are really important. Well, two of these flags were grabbed by officers on horses, and they ran off to try to protect them, to protect the flags, to protect the colors. They were eventually killed, but the flags were saved. Right? But the individuals were killed. Uh, what's going to happen is only a few people are going to get out of there. Lord Chelmsford turned around, eventually figured out, oh, there really is a battle going on. He gets here about uh, 3.30. The battle started really at, uh, between 11 and noon. And as a matter of fact, interestingly enough, at about 2.30 there was an eclipse, and people mentioned it. Like, the sun all of a sudden blackened, and people must have been like, all right. Really an interesting thing. The uh, end result is that very few of the British escaped. Uh, as a matter of fact, they ended up losing 52 officers, 727 regulars, or British regulars. Uh, about 1,300 of these individuals died, almost all of them. Uh, the uh, Zulu lost at least 1,000. We're not 100% certain, but at least 1,000. The mistakes that were made, the British divided their force in the face of the enemy. They sent a force against an enemy that didn't exist. It was a feint. It was, it was fake. Uh, they didn't logger, which was standard procedure. You always dig trenches. You always hide behind your wagons. They didn't do it. When uh, Lord Chelmsford heard that there was an attack, he chose not to believe it. And that allowed for the annihilation of, uh, of this group. I will tell you that on the same day, on exactly the same day, 
the reserve group of about 4,000 or 5,000 Zulus took on a group of 140 British soldiers that had taken up residence at a place called Works Drift. And in that area, there was a church and another building. And what they did is they took their supplies and they built up consecutive rings of defenses. And those 140 soldiers withstood an attack by uh, over 4,000 enemies, right? Because they were defensively hiding behind something and they were well led. Uh, of the 140, they lost 17 of their number, the British, and the Zulu uh, left 351 bodies there. Right? So if you hide behind something and you're well led, you can win a battle against tremendous odds. But the Zulu had just too many people here. And they fought uh, uh, just unbelievably bravely. Uh, the other issue is uh, you don't have to reload an Asagai and you've only got uh, 12 shots a minute with a, a rifle, all right? And eventually you're gonna run out of ammunition and this is going to be a real problem. This, war, this battle does not end the war. Uh, Ketswayu still wants peace and he said trying to get peace is like trying to stop a falling tree. <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. The British, after this horrific loss, redoubled their efforts to take over Zululand. And they sent in a massive army. And over the course of a couple of battles, one of which certainly uh, Lord Chelmsford was involved in because he had to make up for his horrific loss, uh, they ended up at Ulundi capturing Katswayo and entering, ending rather the Zulu War. Uh, so in the long run, the British are gonna win the Anglo-Zulu War, but this battle was won by the Zulu just because of just better tactics. All right. Questions? Yeah. So, like, when the Zulu won this, did they get their supplies? Or did they yes. As a matter of fact, they got a, an unbelievable amount of weapons, tons of ammunition, 2,000 cows, which was a big deal. That was a big deal. And they had all these wagons. They're like, wow, we got a lot of wagons. They, they took all of that. And in part, because they took all of the cattle, Lord Chelmsford could not continue the advance. He had to retreat because that was his food supply. And so that alone is going to make this battle uh, a huge victory. So that first initial invasion into Zululand was a, a horrific disaster. Yeah. What happened when Lord Chelmsford like, got there at three? Uh, good question. When Chelmsford gets there, he has to stay on the battlefield that night, and he couldn't believe the carnage, and he actually ordered his soldiers not to go onto the battlefield because he was afraid that it would completely demoralize and scare them. And so they left. Much later, people went back and ended up uh, creating mass graves for the body and it, bodies, and even if you go there now, you can see cairns erected where uh, groups had, had fallen. Uh, there's one here where Durnford was, there's another group here where another last stand was, and another one over here. It's, a, it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, just so you know, the two gentlemen who grabbed the, the, the colors, grabbed the flags, and ran away were posthumously given the Victoria Cross, which is kind of like our Medal of Honor uh, because of their heroic behavior. By retreating. By retreating but retreating with purpose. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. I clap at the end of battles. <laughs>